So we're here with Professor Daniel Kamen from the University of California at Berkeley, and we're going to be talking today about uh, climate change and sustainability. Thank you so much, Dan, for being with us today. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. We've just met very briefly, but I've been watching your videos and, and uh, reading about your work, and you seem to be a pretty optimistic guy. And I'm teaching this course on uh, some of the great problems facing the world, and you know, there are times that I'm reading about it, um, it's, it's pretty daunting. When you look at the situation around climate change, what, what's, what scares you the most? What are the things that concern you the most? Well, I mean, I, I am optimistic, I have to admit, but I am pretty worried because we've known about climate change as a scientific principle since the 1800s. There have been papers in even popular journals like Scientific American since 1959 We've had famous series of data collected from the top of mountains in Hawaii and from ice cores in Greenland, in the Arctic for decades now. The records are all the same. They're all very, very compelling. We've been underinvesting in research. We've been very slow establishing programs in universities, in companies, in the government that are truly up to the task because this is a very interdisciplinary, very interrelated problem. And those are the reasons why I'm most worried, because as a scientist, I feel that we have known what the problem is for a long time. And as Toto said, never likes to quote, the problem is us. And we've also been seeing more and more graphic examples of how severe climate change can be today, which is really on just like taking the first baby step into a different world. Yeah. And those are the reasons why I'm incredibly worried that our response is simply not up to the task. So when you started your academic career, were you already oriented towards climate and energy or did you come to it from a – maybe you could talk a little bit about your own itinerary. So not at all. I mean I, I wish I could be one of those students who knew where they were going. Ah. Uh, I basically grew up on science fiction books and Star Trek and that made me want to be an astronaut. And so I did all of the things that you do as a child growing up in the 70s uh -huh. around that, meaning did lots and lots of physics project, did astronomy, um, uh, learned to fly airplanes, did a lot of the kinds of, of physical survival type stuff as well as doing a lot of physics. And didn't really know where I would go. My father was a historian. So the academic path is one that I was aware of. But I went through all of school and my postdoctoral position in physics, in astrophysics, in particle theory. And while I was a graduate student, I heard about a little nonprofit group based in Berkeley called Technica that sent technical volunteers to work with the Nicaraguan, the Sandinista government when they were embargoed by the U.S. And this was during Reagan and Oliver North and uh -huh. Contra issues. So I went down to Nicaragua for a couple summers working on solar ovens and small windmills and various projects and got so excited about it that I did a second postdoc back at Harvard where I did my Ph.D. in the physics of climate. So I did climate models for a while. And then that led me more and more to be interested in what we're today calling solution science, thinking about what are our opportunities. But back then, you know, in the distant times, my daughters say when dinosaurs roamed the earth, but we're <laughs> talking about the 1990s. Yeah. Um, and so it was energy, which wasn't even a field, and it's become a loosely defined area of solution science today. And that's what's been my passion ever since. So when you when you travel around, uh, to, uh, you've taught at different universities, I know, and you you travel around quite a bit uh, for your research and also speaking to student groups. How how do you get people to care about a long term problem like this? I I just reviewed a book um, called Focus, which uh, argues that you know we're just hardwired not to care about things for the long duration and these kinds of you know um, the obstacles f to get humans to pay attention to things that. Uh, uh, that unfold over a long period of time. H how do you get people to care? 
Well, Focus is a great book. I, I have a teenage daughter and an 11-year-old, and every time there's a new app for the iPhone, they're totally fixated, and no matter what you tell them, they claim they can multitask and do this and something else, and they can't. And so I, I worry about that. And, and unfortunately, climate change is exactly that issue. So I have a close friend and a colleague here at Berkeley, George Lakoff, right. a neuroscientist, now linguist. And George, who has written kind of you know, tomes and very popular books for politicians uh, to think about issues and framing, really highlighted the problem to me when he said he studied many languages and there's no language on the planet that has a simple verb form for when the system acts on you as the individual. So we always say things like mother nature or the man or the machine or whatever else. And all the, these are just ways to anthropomorphize big complex things that act on us. But of course, climate change is exactly that because even though we're causing it, we see climate change in subtle or not subtle changes in weather, in water quality, in plants, in food, in storm damages. All of these things, we don't have a verb form to describe in George's terms. Right. And so because I couldn't resist trying to – I don't think I did, but I tried to one-up him. I said, <laughs> well, you may think there's no verb form, but the other sad fact is that there's no currency either because a few places in the planet, California – um, have a price on greenhouse gas emissions, and so a, a carbon price, but most of the world doesn't. And so if we have no language in George's terms and no currency in my term, we're, we're fighting a pretty big uphill battle. But you, but you have receptive audiences, so what, what, are your, what are the ways you get people to, to pay attention and to actually start changing their behavior? So I mean, the, 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 there's no simple answer to that, unfortunately, but it's, it, it varies over time. Certainly when we were collecting huge amounts of data that was just showing that climate change was really starting to take place, this is back in the 1990s in the various intergovernmental panel reports, the IPCC, trying to show the data was all the rage. And we combined that data with models to look what would happen way, way off in the year in the year 2010, right. way, way off in the year 2020, 2030, 2050. And those are pretty scary. But because of this lack of language, anything which is complex and you then try to model to show it's going to happen, that might work for experts, but that's not a good do public dialogue. So sadly, these recent events, the huge fires in Russia and India and Australia and Southern Europe, Hurricane Sandy, uh, Ty Typhoon Hayun, these events we talk about a lot. And they're important data points to start connecting environmental change with cost. But I don't think it goes anywhere far enough. And so what I'm finding is kind of a more interesting starting point today, and it may be a little different in a year or two, is that... There are kind of two environment problems, two energy problems I worry about in just about equal measure. <clears throat> one of them is environmental change, climate change. But the other is that one-fifth of the people on the planet don't have access to even basic energy services. Right. It's not just rural off-grid people in, in parts of South Sudan where I work or Nicaragua. It's lots of urban dwellers, the huge megacities around the world have lots of people who either have no access except for burning trash or dung or firewood, but also people who officially have access, but the, the electricity is too expensive or too intermittent. India a year ago had the world's biggest blackout. <clears throat> and so I find today the back and forth between our energy mix has to dramatically change, radically decarbonize. Right. And right. We need to radically ramp up the amount of energy we're providing to people who have really none. And today I'm finding that conversation uh, a good nexus because solving climate change looks horrific in the sense of, you know, we're going to need to create a new industrial revolution, not over 150 years like the last one, but over the next three decades. So that kind of a compressed timetable. And that problem gets some interest. But when you talk about technologies like small scale solar panels, um, systems that digest urban waste and make energy, you kind of get people's entrepreneurial juices flowing more. Yeah. And even though that doesn't solve it all at once, 
it brings the problem down to that personal scale. Yeah. Um, and I think one thing that I've tried to learn from the world of medical research and biotechnology is that one reason why the policy issues and debates around anything from Obamacare to in the 90s when the federal government decided to double the amount we were spending on uh, on the National Institutes of Health was that everyone can see how that those expenditures might affect them personally. Right. If they're going to get cancer, if they're going to need to have um, d uh, different operations and different therapies. And even though if you don't buy all of medicine, mm -hmm. you can see how it affects you. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and learning lessons from that experience is something that I've been trying to work on in the world of energy. And so it really involves ping pong back and forth between the big picture climate story and the real nitty gritty of, Here's a solar cell flashlight yeah. radio combination for a rural house in Dars in, in Tanzania or something. It's very interesting because in, you know this class had its uh, origins in the Social Good Summit in New York uh, during the Uni United Nations Week, and many of the presentations were about these uh, small scale interventions that perhaps could scale uh, up in, in interesting ways, and they provided both a source of encouragement. And a kind of cl almost like clinical research, they created um, uh, hope and gave data at the same time, and I think it's it's uh, it was very energizing. So the, these um, these uh, small scale uh, changes, uh, which are often generated, I guess, by entrepreneurs or small uh, organizations, uh, and then can be adopted by large corporations or by governments. Um, uh, they, they can provide real momentum, I think, for providing energy to those who don't have it, but providing it in a way that doesn't make the climate change issues worse. I, I know you teach a class uh, with, with others on the future of energy, and I wonder if you could tell our students in this Coursera class, which uh, we suspect will have you know, tens of thousands of students, mostly outside of the U.S., uh, I'm sure they would like to hear a little bit about what the future of energy class is like that, that you're teaching in. So the class I do is interesting. It's actually um, part of University of California, Berkeley's adult and continuing education. So it's really open to the community. Mm -hmm. And I spent uh, 2010, 2011 as the, the, the chief officer of the World Bank for energy efficiency and renewable energy. And so spent a lot of time more or less doing a roadshow to politicians, ministers of energy, finance, um, you know, people who had a chance to really influence the energy economies all around the world. And because the amount of energy we're using in Europe, in the U.S., in Japan, Korea, is pretty flat. The real growth is not just India and China, but right. all of the developing countries. And so that bigger conversation is where we start most, most of the stories. And in the future of energy class that, that I've been doing this past year, I think the most striking feature has been – the degree to which the lessons of other fields have not permeated in very well into energy. And so, for example, successful or not, when we were incredibly worried in the 1960s about food availability around the world and famines, we set up a global network called the CGIAR, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, the so-called Green Revolution. Right. And there's been a lot of criticism about did it really reach poor farmers? Was it a good thing if you're already rich and not right. so good if you're poor? There's a lot to, um, to really worry about. But the fact is that yields for a number of crops went up dramatically and that the international networks of extension – and since I, I was an undergraduate at Cornell, one of the great land-grant yeah. U.S. universities, the process of not just having people in the lab, but having an even more significant extension service is something that we certainly have in ag. We have it for better and worse uh, in civil engineering with the Army Corps of Engineers and many state infrastructure agencies. And we definitely have it in the land of medical and biotechnology, where my wife, who's a radiologist, gets visited almost every day by not just someone who's selling a new piece of hardware, but someone willing to offer courses in its use as part of the uptake. Right. The energy world has none of that. It's totally a story of some academic research 
underfunded by by every standard I can by every metric I can develop, and very big corporations that are doing research but are already tied into the current energy system. So even though they're very smart and very capable, they have not been given any incentive to change. Yeah. And that equation of little entrepreneurs and until recently largely disinterested big companies has set up a divide. And that divide was made even even more strong because the first wave of interest in energy and climate really came from an environmental movement that saw mainstream economics and the world of business as the enemy. Right. If you go back to Silent Spring and Rachel Carson, it was very much a us, the recipient of poisons against them. Right. And there's been wonderful work since, but only in the last under a decade have we even started to see that bridge being being crossed where now I have students who are from – not only the scientific disciplines, kind of my background, but right. also people from sociology, rhetoric, business schools, all kinds of places that were not seen as part of kind of a team before. Yeah. And so a lot of what we do in the course, after we kind of look at what's exciting about solar, wind, biomass, what's happening with natural gas, the kind of the energy resources side of the story, is to look where are we actually learning to use these in combination and that's been a revelation so it's the teamwork side that uh the multidisciplinary teamwork side that's that's been so exciting it, it, exciting and also needed because while we talk about it now we, we are still very early on 15 years ago if you were a professor in biotechnology um it was it was often seen as a bit unusual if you didn't also have a company right in energy that was totally absent. And so only now are we starting to see faculty members leaving the university and going to form companies or doing the kind of partnerships that are really quite common in many other fields. Right. There's There are some interesting ethical issues about using public money, yeah. do your lab work, and then go spin off companies. Right. Whatever comes out of that dialogue as we kind of look back at the 20th century, it's clear that some version of that tighter connection energy has needed and still needs and is only beginning to be to be pulled together so that's a big deal in terms of figuring out solutions which which technologies that you see on the horizon are you most excited about which are the ones that you find have the greatest potential so interestingly the one that i i find has the most potential is remains solar power Uh and It's a bit funny to say that because we need to solve this problem in a few decades and solar is less than 1% of electricity in the United States. And anytime you say, well, I'm going to put a lot of weight on scaling something up that's under 1% today, it's a big risk. Part of the solution, you're you're taking a gamble. But solar power has dropped so dramatically in cost over the past uh, decade and a half, combination of kind of an, an international relay race where Japan in the 90s was the big leader in manufacturing and research. And as the Japanese uh, economy sat in the doldrums, they did a lot, but then they really passed the, the, the baton to Germany. Right. It became the huge international leader. And in fact, Germany has hit a milestone just last year that really no one thought would happen. There was a, uh, in individual days, often in the spring, where half of the electricity in the German mix is from solar, wow. 50%. Even the most optimistic people 10 years ago weren't saying that was possible. And so when we talk about lots of different solar technologies, everything from big arrays in the desert to every roof being solar, a friend of mine at Caltech has a company where they literally spray on solar panels with one of those power sprayer, the right. paint, the Wagner power sprayer. Uh-huh. Um, the utility that operates here in Northern California, Pacific Gas and Electric, has contracted for space-based solar that will beam the power down. Huh. So there's never a nighttime, and so it's 24-7 solar. And so I see over the coming decades, we will look at solar as a huge piece of not just the clean energy, but of the base load. And maybe a third of our energy by mid-century comes from solar, but that still leaves two-thirds elsewhere. Right. And so we have this 
ongoing tension around nuclear power. Some people think it absolutely must be central to the solution. Others think that we have to absolutely phase it out entirely. Even though I'm a professor of nuclear engineering, I am still of mixed minds about where nuclear is going. Um, for better or worse right now, um, and leaving the accidents aside um, at Chernobyl and Fukushima, nuclear today is in a spot it's never been in before. There is now vastly more private sector energy uh, uh, money going into nuclear than public sector. And in the past, nuclear always seemed like something so large. Yeah. It's only done by governments. And so I don't know if this new private push for much more smaller modular reactors is going to uh, bear any fruit or not, or just look like more of the problems that we've seen in the past. But it's certainly one that one has to talk about. Do you see most of the experiments around nuclear uh, happening in China? Because, uh, I mean, places like California, right, this is not, it's not part of the equation. It's not part of the equation. In fact, in fact California, if you go back to the 1970s, when we were building a lot of nuclear plants in the United States, there was at one point there was a forecast there would be a nuclear plant every five miles on the California coast. Today we're down to one plant one, right? in Diablo Canyon plant, and that one is set to close in, in a couple decades, and it's illegal to build more. Right. So half of all the new nuclear plants scheduled to be built around the world are right now scheduled to be built in China, and that number in China is 30 by 2030. Well, even if all those 30 get built in China and another 30 in the rest of the world, that means the nuclear without some other huge change is in a death spiral because there's 430 nuclear plants around the world today. All of them have to be replaced by about 2030. They all, all their life, their, their lifetimes, even when the extension will, will be up. And so building 60 or 120 or yeah. 240, it doesn't, it's not even replacing the fraction we have now. So nuclear will need something to change, which is even bigger than China loving it, for it to be part of the future. And so when I look at the future that seems most likely where we make it in terms of climate change, it's a world with a huge baseload chunk of solar, kind of 30% of our energy from solar, another 20%, one-fifth from wind power, Biomass and geothermal, perhaps making up five to ten percent each, and becoming much more efficient to beat down some of that new demand. And when you add all of that up, you're still left with a gap of about a third. 